Lord's house this morning. Happy Mother's Day to each of, uh, of you mothers here this morning. And uh, hope you have had the chance to wish your mother a happy Mother's Day as well, if she's still uh, here and not with the Lord. We're going to open this morning 448. 448. Brethren, we have met to worship. Stand with me if you're able. 448. you to open the service in prayer. Father, thank you for the Lord's day. Thank you that we can have a day when we honor our mothers. Bless every mom that's here today, every lady that's here, your Lord, help them to feel honored because we have a day that honors them. Bless our pastor, they preach this to us. Tender our hearts for the message, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. 367. 367, my mother's Bible. This, uh, the way this is written, you got to really pay attention. The first two lines there goes down to the second line, and then goes back up to the first line, down to the third line. So, uh, really, gonna, it keeps you awake. But we're going to sing a couple verses of this 367 My Mother's Bible. There's a dear and precious book, though it's worn and faded now, which recalls those happy days of long ago. When I stood at mother's knee with her hand upon my brow, and I heard her voice in gentle tones and low, precious book, precious book, on my dear old tears take leaves I love to Sweeter day by day as I walk the narrow way, that leads at last to that bright home above. As she read the stories o'er of those mighty men of old, of Joseph and of Daniel and his trials, of little David Bold, who became a king at last, of and his many wicked wives. Oh, 
I love to look. Thou art sweeter day by day as I walk the pilgrim way. That leads at last to that right home of verse number four. Well, those days are past and gone, but their memories linger still. And the dear old book has, has been my guide. And I seek to do his will as my mother taught me then. And ever in my heart his word abide. Blessed book, precious book. In thy dear old tear stained leaves I love to look. Thou art sweeter day by day as I walk the narrow way. At last to that bright home above. Amen. Good singing this morning. How'd you do keeping up on all that switch in there? <laughs> That's quite a... It keeps you awake. We're going to have the ushers come this morning, and we're going to have uh, our offering taken the traditional way. It's been so long since we've done it this way. Maybe this isn't the normal way anymore. I don't know. But... Uh, we're going to do it this way. Brother Merlin, could I ask you to ask the Lord's blessing upon the offering? Father, I just thank you for good music. Thank you for the way it lifts our hearts, Lord. And I pray you bless mothers this morning. I pray you bless this offering for this church in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As far as announcements come, uh, go for this coming week. We have soul winning on next Saturday, 10, 10 o'clock. It's a blessing to get out. It's an encouragement to our hearts to, to see the response in the community. And um, that will bless your heart as well, I'm sure. This evening, we are having a, a missionary come in. He, we, he's been trying to connect with me, and he was supposed to be here a few Wednesdays ago, but his car broke down halfway here, and just things went wrong. Well, he contacted me a couple days ago, and he said, uh, well, I'm going to be in a church close to you Sunday morning. Can I come Sunday night? So he's going to be with us. Brian Regera, going to the Philippines, his native, uh, his native uh, country. And so he's got a head start there. He doesn't have to learn a language. But uh, that will be a blessing here tonight. Then we have a youth rally coming up on Friday, 7 o'clock, the 14th, Friday the 14th, 7 o'clock. Brother Andy's uh, heading that up. And on Sunday, Brother Ron Weber will be with us. We're going to have our normal uh, morning service and uh, then a fellowship lunch and then a 1 o'clock afternoon service so he gets a chance to get back to his home. My wife and I will be down in Florida picking up our daughter at college, uh, Melanie down there at college. So I'm sure that will be a, a blessing. Uh, many of you know Brother Ron Weber. And then Saturday, the 22nd, we'll be quizzing with the teens in, uh, how are you doing on your studying? You got, you got ready, raring to go? All right. Um, Tinley Park, Illinois. We'll be in Tinley Park. <coughs> Brother uh, Paul Peruki, who was speaking here last um, week on, on missions, uh, he is going to have a special meeting with Brother Clayton, somebody that's a local speaker here for years and years. He's up in years now. He's going to have one last uh, uh, service, kind of a grand finale. Uh, I believe that will be in Constantine Bible Baptist Church. He was trying to have it here in Howe, but I don't think that worked out. But um, he's going to have that, that with Brother Clayton on Saturday the 22nd at 7 o'clock. And so anybody wants uh, more information on that, come see me. And that'll be, that'll be a blessing. 
Uh, we just came through four days, meetings, four, four, um, five meetings, but four days of, of missions. Uh, gi- uh, and and I'd just like to challenge us to towards missions, giving to missions. I know I, I uh, was blessed with these challenging uh, services and the speaker's the, the speaker's heart and the spe- speaker's experience concerning that. And I'd just like to challenge us to, to push the borders of, of our faith. You know, I'm not the kind of uh, step off a cliff faith kind of guy. I'm not, I'm not that kind of guy. I, I, I don't, I, Jesus, when the devil told him to jump off the pinnacle of the temple, he said no. <laughs> and um, I think that that does many... Uh, that does many times gives the devil an inroad to uh, discourage us. Um, I'm going to give $1,000 a week to missions, jump off a cliff kind of faith, you know. And then two weeks down the road, when God doesn't do what you expected him to do, the devil discourages our heart. But we do need to push the borders of our faith and allow God to show us what he can do. And so I'd encourage you to, to give toward missions Push the borders of your faith. Even the, uh, even the youngest of us can do something for missions. I'm reminded of a story. Um, John Bechtel. He, his parents were missionaries in Hong Kong. He was born 1939. And he and his mother were on the last boat out of Hong Kong when the Japanese came in and, and took it over. And the Lord stirred his heart. In 1960, he went back as a missionary where his parents had been and he had a heart for kids and he, and he got his eyes on this uh, multi-million dollar complex and he wanted to start a, a, a camp there for, for uh, missions for the, for the community, that city. And so he went and this, this, uh, this complex went into bankruptcy and so he went in and, and put an offer on it, and then he traveled the world. Not just the United States, he traveled the world trying to, to raise money. And people just saw this as a ginormous project, and, and nobody got on board, nobody gave. And so he went back to Hong Kong. He was very discouraged, very uh, distraught about it. He, he thought that, that the Lord was in this. And while he was in his discouragement, he got a, uh, a letter from a real little girl. In, in, in America and she had uh, sent him a dollar and asked that uh, he use it toward getting this, this camp. Well, the Lord touched his heart. He took that dollar. He went down to the, to the commission there and they accepted that dollar as full payment for this multi-million dollar complex. And since that time, two million campers have gone through that camp. 160,000 have professed Jesus Christ as their Savior through that ministry. Don't underestimate God. Don't limit God. And uh, don't, don't, uh, you know, don't belittle what God can multiply your, your gift to when, when given to him. So I'd just like to encourage you towards that. And um, I know we have a real heart for missions here in the church. And uh, I, I appreciate it. I, I, I love it. I love And I think the Lord blesses us because of it. Well, today is Mother's Day. I wanted to do something very special for the mothers. And so we got each one of you a a corsage. I'd like to to, to give them to you at this time. So, are they pretty?
Well, we appreciate you. We appreciate your godly example. We appreciate your prayers for us. Tell you what, we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't be able to do what we do without the support and prayers and oftentimes godly advice and guidance that we receive from you. We appreciate you very much. 145. One more hymn, 145. Then we're going to have a couple specials. It is well with my soul. 145, you may remain seated. <clears throat> when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrow like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou From 2 Kings chapter 4, and in that chapter, a lady who was distraught said, it is well. Verse number 2. Oh, Satan should bow, oh, try
crying out my heart to you. You alone will be my glory. Nothing in this world I see. You have cleansed and sanctified me. You yourself has set me free. You have cleansed and sanctified me. certainly do. Calm or the storm. Take your Bibles this morning. Thank you, ladies. Appreciate that. <coughs> Take your Bibles this morning and turn to Noah, to 2 Kings chapter 4, if you will. 2 Kings chapter 4. Last Sunday night, we were in 2 Kings chapter 4. This passage in the first seven verses, we're going to pick it up in verse number 8. What happens, where do you go when a crisis hit home, hits home? As a child, you run to your mother. As an adult, where do you run to? To the Heavenly Father? To the world? Where do you run to? 2 Kings chapter 4 and verse number 8. And it fell on a day that Elisha passed to Shunem, where was a great woman, and she constrained him to eat bread. And so it was that as oft as he passed by, he turned in thither to eat bread. And she said unto her husband, 
Behold now, I perceive that this is an holy man of God, which passeth by us continually. Let us make a little chamber, I pray thee, on the wall, and let us set for him there a bed, and a table, and a stool, and a candlestick, and it shall be when he cometh to us that he shall turn in thither. And it fell on a day that he came thither, and he turned into the chamber, and lay there, and he said to Gehazi his servant, Call this Shunammite. And when he had called her, she stood before him, and he said unto and she and he said unto him, Say now unto her, Behold, thou hast been careful for us with all this care. What is to be done for thee? Wouldst thou be spoken for to the king or to the captain of the host? And she answered, I dwell among mine own people. And he said, What then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered. Verily she hath no child, and her husband is old. And he said, Call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the door, and he said, About this season, according to the time of life, thou shalt embrace a son. And she said, Nay, my lord, thou man of God, do not lie unto thine handmaid. And the woman conceived and bare a son at the season that Elisha had said unto her, according to the time of life. And when the child was grown, it fell on a day that he went out to his father, to the reapers, and he said unto his father, My head, my head. And he said to a lad, Carry him to his mother. And when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon and then died. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door upon him and went out. And she called unto her husband and said, Send me, I pray thee, one of the young men, men and one of the asses, that I may run to the man of God and come again. And he said, Wherefore wilt thou go to him today? It is neither new, mo new moon nor the Sabbath. And she said, It shall be well. Then she saddled an ass and said to her servant, Drive and go forward, slack not in thy riding for me, except I bid thee. So she went and came to the man of God to Mount Carmel, and it came to pass when the man of God saw her afar off, that he said to Gehazi his servant, Behold, yonder is that Shunammite. Run now, I pray thee, to meet her, and say unto her, Is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered, It is well. And when she came to the man of God, to the hill, she caught him by the feet, but Gehazi came near to thrust her away. And the man of God said, Let her alone, for her soul is vexed within her, and the Lord hath hid it from me, and hath not told me. And she said, did I desire a son of my Lord? And did I not say, Do not deceive me? Then he said unto Gehazi, Gird up thy loins, and take my staff in thine hand, and go thy way. If thou meet any man, salute him not, and if any salute thee, answer him not again, and lay my staff upon the face of the child. And the mother of the child said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And he arose and followed her. And Gehazi passed on before them and laid the staff upon the face of the child, but there was neither voice nor hearing. Wherefore he went again to meet him and told him, saying, The child is not awake. And when Elisha was come into the house, behold, the child was dead and laid upon his bed. And he went in, therefore, and shut the door upon them twain. And he prayed unto the Lord. And he went up and lay, the, uh, lay upon the child and put his mouth upon his mouth, his eyes upon his eyes and his hands upon his hands. And he stretched himself upon the child and the flesh of the child waxed warm. Then he returned and walked in the house to and fro and went up and stretched himself upon him. And the child sneezed seven times and the child opened his eyes. And he called Gehazi and said, Call this Shunammite. So he called her. And when she was come in unto her, he said, unto him, he said, Take up thy son. And she went in and fell at his feet and bowed herself to the ground and took up her son and went out.
Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this story of a mother's love. That when every, everybody else would have given up, she carried on. When everybody else would have given up faith, she had faith. Lord, we thank you for godly mothers, godly wives that hold us up, that pray for us. Lord, we give thee thanks this morning. Be with us, be in our midst, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're a mother here this morning, probably all kinds of emotions are running through your head. As you think back to when your children were were young and the many things that, that have happened or, or may have happened, possibly, possibly could have happened, were it not for God's intervention, maybe not too distant memories. I can only imagine the things that my mother endured raising 15 children. The, the, the stress that we, we gave her, the, the crisis many times that we brought to her lives. I remember one time when I was about 10 years old out playing and I, we were playing tag and I whipped around and I hit that pokey out thing on the flagpole. You know what I'm talking about? They wrapped the, the rope around and it split my, my eyebrow right, right down the middle. And I went to guess who? Mom. I went running to mom and I had my hand cupped over my eye like this, and it was blood everywhere. Blood down my hand, blood coming down my face, and she had to pull my hand away. She had no idea what to expect. She didn't know if I had an eye. She didn't know if there was something in the eye. I was just screaming and hollering. Stress and crisis are two different things. You know, stress is the, is the everyday pressure and, and sometimes toxicity that we deal with. And uh, some people are, sometimes you can, you can let it get to you and sometimes you can let it go. But, but a crisis is the toxicity that happens unexpectedly. And it doesn't matter how important the thing you're doing right now is, it has to drop as you take care of a problem as you take care of this, this, this crisis. Three times this passage says, and it fell upon a day. There was nothing she could do to control this. It happened. She just had to deal with it. It's probably a hard decision for her to allow her child, her, her only son, to go out in the field with her, her father his father, uh, to go out in the field. And, and uh, this is a farming business with a lot of moving parts. And, and, uh, and she lets him go. She faces that stress. She faces those fears. And she allows him to go. He has to learn at some point. And of course, her worst fear turns into a reality as her son is carried back to her. We're not told what happened. Maybe it was a sunstroke. Maybe he exerted himself in all of his, his excitement a little bit too much. Maybe he had whacked his head on the reaper or some other thing. We're not told what happened to him, but he says to his father, my head, my head. And isn't it interesting how people, especially dads, assume that mom will know what to do? She doesn't have a medical degree. Most moms don't. We're not told that she did. But 3,000 years ago, this dad did exactly what I would have done today. <laughs> Take him to see mom. She'll know what to do. He has a fever, she'll know what to do. He hurt his head, she'll know what to do. Carry him to his mother, she'll know what he needs. She'll just take one look at him and know exactly what is wrong. You know, this has happened to me on several occasions. I'll be in an emergency room or, or in a doctor's office, and they'll start asking me questions. Why, why do doctors ask dads questions? <laughs> Medical history. And, and, and I'll, I'll do it every time. Just give me a second. I'm calling mom. Because <laughs> mom will remember every fever. 
Mom remembers every bug bite and sting. Mom remembers uh, everything. She remembers the weight and length of the child. She remembers what hat she was wearing when she was born in, in the hospital bed. Oh, call it a curse or a blessing. God has given mothers the ability to remember everything about every child. And hey, here's just a little bit of advice for any prospective employers out there. Don't send a kid home sick. The mom is already cleared to work. <laughs> mom says he's not sick. Don't send him home. <laughs> no, we're not told how old this child was. We're not told. I think he's probably around 12 years old. We're told that he was grown. In, in, in Jewish uh, mindset, and you come to adulthood, so to speak, a portion of adulthood at, at 12 years old, and yet he was small enough for one lad to carry him. He was small enough to, to sit on his mother's knees and for, him, for her to carry him up to the, the prophet's bed. I think maybe he was probably about 12 years old, and, and, uh, but we're not told. And, and you know, I'm not going to knock the dad. I'm a dad. And this is the way I would have reacted. But he didn't think it was anything very important. Maybe he, he felt really horrible about it afterwards or when everything was all said and done. But he, he sends him to his mother. And, uh, and, you know, he's like, take him to mom. He probably needs an Advil and a nap. sent him home and kept on working. Well, this mom was faced with a crisis. This mom was faced with, with stress like she had never had before. And, and we see the response of this godly woman going to God in her time of trouble. I want to look here this morning briefly about what God says about this godly woman. What God says about, pardon me, her character. Number one, in verse number eight, the first verse there, it says she was a great woman. She had affluence and influence. I don't think this is talking about her size or her weight. <laughs> and she was a great woman. No, it's not, because obviously down a few verses, the, the child had knees to sit on. But anyway... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he was a, she was a great woman no, in, in influence. She was very wealthy and influential in her community, but more so, this speaks of her character. She was a great a woman of great character. We read of her kindness. We read of her love. We read of her consideration. She was the originator of the prophet's chamber. Everybody who has built a prophet's chamber in the church or, or, or in their home ever since got it from this woman. She's very influential. Uh, uh, she was kind to both family and strangers. She had courage. She had stamina. She shone in her community, not because she put her, herself out there to be noticed, but rather uh, she, 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 was, she had quiet faithfulness and character. The heart of her husband trusted in her. She was doing him good and not evil. Strength and honor were her clothing, and she rejoiced, she rejoiced in time to come. Proverbs 31 speaks those words. She was not idle. She looked well to the ways of her household. The Bible does not say she was great because she was noted. The Bible does not say they are noticed. She doesn't say that she was lauded in her community. It doesn't say that she was uh, considered to be great or recognized. It says she was great. And I can say it is better to be of great character and not recognized than to be president and have no character at all. Number one, she was a great woman. Number two, she was hospitable. She was hospitable. She constrained the servant of God to eat bread at her house. And when Elijah passed that way, she made a habit of calling to him and saying, Come on in for a meal. You must be tired. You must be weary. Uh, sit down at our table. She was observant. She was perceptive. She perceived that Elisha was a man of God, 
Not only did she perceive that Elisha was a man of God, she perceived that he was a holy man of God. Can I say there's a lot of men of God in our communities and in our nation who are not holy. Oftentimes, the most a wicked sinner is standing behind a pulpit. She perceived that he was a holy man of God. You know, my, many people are uncomfortable um, around a man of God, especially one that is holy. But she wasn't. She was not uncomfortable. She, she perceived that he was a man of God, and she invited her in, him into her house. She wanted that influence in her house. She wasn't a gadabout. She wasn't found uh, over at the neighbor's house. The lad brought him to his mother. She was at home. She wasn't a, a, out climbing the social ladder. You know, she was perceptive. She was perceptive. Intuition is a gift of God, but perception is gained at the feet of Jesus Christ. It is, it is uh, gained at Jesus' feet. She perceived where the power was. She perceived where God was working, and she got there. Also, she was a godly woman. She perceived that Elisha was a holy man of God, and she still wanted him around. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of God, receiveth not the things of God, for they are foolishness unto them, unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. God's principles and practices make life simple. Proverbs speaks of witty inventions. Wisdom, I wisdom dwell with prudence. And find out knowledge of witty inventions. In other words, God's wisdom, God's knowledge, gives common sense that makes complex things simple. And many people around will think, why didn't I think of that? Because you're not uh, discerning of God. The things of God cannot be understood or received by people who want nothing to do with God. Pharaoh had a dream. Who did they call? The magicians and the astrologers couldn't do a thing for him. They had to call a man of God. Someone who was close to God. Why? Because the dream was from God. It's just that simple. This woman was perceptive. This woman was spiritual. She did not have the word of God in her hand like we do today. But she knew where to find the words of God. And so she went to the man of God who God used... In in that day, in that area, to show his mind. When her heart was burdened so much that even she knew her husband couldn't help, she knew where to find comfort from God. She did not give up at God. She did not, she did, did not get angry at God. She did not question God or turn from God. She didn't tell people that God didn't care. She said to her husband, It shall be well. It's not well right now, but it shall be. It shall be well. How many of us, when we are burdened with some fear, with some guilt, with some anger, with some grief or, or, or panic or feeling of, of hopelessness, do we run from God and not to Him? The only true answer to our grief is found in the arms of the Savior. The only true answer to our hurt can be found in Jesus Christ, she was a godly woman. Number five, she was a generous woman. She said, let us make a chamber and put a few things in it for the man of God when he comes this way. A generous mother will often at times have generous children. You don't have to have a lot to share a little. Fact is, those who have a lot seldom share anything. She was generous. She wanted to make room in her house to host the man of God. It was, surely, it was sure to have an effect upon her son in years to come. Number six, she was not envious or covetous. She was content. She was content. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Elisha asked her, how can I repay this kindness that you've shown to me? And she said, I didn't do this to be repaid. I didn't do it to get, I didn't give something to get something. 
And he said, can, can I speak of you to the king? Could I speak of you to the captain of the host? Is there something that you need? Is there some protection you need? Supply of your need? And she said, I dwell among my people. In other words, I don't think of myself as better than other people. I don't deserve something better than, than what everybody else has. I dwell among my people. I don't deserve special treatment. She was obviously much younger than her husband. Uh, the Gehazi said, uh, this lady has no children and her husband is old. But she wasn't a gold digger. She didn't get into this marriage and, and, and make sure that her husband uh, worked overtime to supply her with a certain level of luxury. No, she was content. She was content. Number seven, she was first and forno foremost a mother. She was first and foremost a mother. I know I said this earlier, that she was a, uh, uh, pardon me, getting ahead of myself. I, I, I'm, I'm sure there was plenty to, to keep her, her occupied. I'm sure there was plenty who, who wanted to see her join this club or this institution or be the head of this and that because of her influence and because of her means, her affluence. Uh, but I tell you what, in verse number 20, she set everything aside and held her son when the crisis hit home. She was foremost a mother. We're not told how long, probably several hours. Hey, if her son was in that condition for, for any length of time longer, she would have been there. She would have held him. She didn't lay him on the bed and leave him. And No, she held him. She was foremost a mother. She did everything she could. She gave him every bit of care. She couldn't grab a phone and call 911. But she did everything she could. She laid everything aside and took care of her son. Number eight, she was a woman of faith. She was a woman of faith. I already said she was a godly mother. But you know, being godly is not synonymous with having faith. It's not. Jesus rebuked the 12 disciples on several occasions for having no faith at all. They loved Christ. They, they, they left everything behind for Christ. But they didn't have faith. This woman, was, this, this woman was a woman of faith. She didn't scream and accuse God. She didn't scream and accuse her, her husband. She didn't even accuse the man of God. She asked him why. But she didn't accuse him in this time of crisis. She went and, and put her son on the prophet's chamber, on the bed, shut the door, and went to find the man of God. I'm sure she thought back to the time when she spoke with Elisha. I'm sure she, she, she thought back and, and wondered within herself, God, I, I, I know that I'm your child. I, I know that... You don't want me to hurt. You gave me this son. He was a special gift from you. It's certainly not your desire to take him from me. You know, Abraham thought the same thing as he stood there with Isaac on the altar. Why? I don't understand. But I'm going to seek until I find the answer. I'm going to seek until I, I get that satisfaction. She never gave up believing on God. She was a woman of faith. How many times... Do, do, do you and I come to a place of crisis and my mind or your mind maybe does the same thing and goes back to, oh no, I wonder if the Lord is judging me for this or that that I've done and I never got it straightened out. This was not her connect, this was This was not her condition. She was already right with God. She was already right. She didn't have to uh, reconnect the, the prayer line. So the storms of life didn't come down and, and, and crash her connection with heaven. She did not discuss her problem with the servant that sent to drive her. She did not discuss her problem with the, the man of God's servant, Gehazi. She went right to Elisha, the man of God, and she poured out all of her heart. Number nine as we quickly hasten on, 
She was a faithful woman. I, I know I already said she was a, a, a woman of faith, but she was a faithful woman. She was faithful in her worship. She already was. In verse number 23, she quickly asked her husband to, to send a servant and, and, a, and a donkey that they can, could go, hook up to a cart and go. And, and, the man of, and her husband said, why are you going to see the man of God today? It's, it's not a, a holy day. It's not the Sabbath day. Why did he say that? Because she was already faithful every week, every time the doors were open where she could sit and learn of God, she was there. She was faithful. She was right with God. Whenever these days came around, she was never too busy to worship God. And then she was a prayerful woman. She was a prayerful woman. How many times you and I in Go to the Lord in our distress. And after five minutes without heaven opening and an answer coming down, we quit. And we give up. She didn't give up. Verse number 30. As the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. I'm going to stay on my knees uh, until I get an answer, until I get satisfaction, I will be importuned. Persistent. You see, this woman perceived something else. She perceived that she didn't need that staff laid upon her child. She needed God's power. Lord, I don't need the staff. I don't need somebody at this point in my life, in this time of crisis, telling me my faults and my failures. I don't need somebody to come and quote a verse for me. I already know those verses. I don't need some spiritual rhetoric. I need the power of God. Amen. It's good to be persistent when you know your request is good. It's good to have a mother who will pray for you when everybody else has written you off as a goner. Not a single person would have been able to do anything else for this boy. So she didn't go to anybody else. But she didn't write him off. She went to God. She didn't believe that God was done with her son. She didn't accept that, 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 that he was dead and that was it. She kept on praying. She was a prayerful woman. Lastly, she was thankful. When her problem was solved, her son was resuscitated, she stopped, first of all, and gave thanks to God. She was thankful. What an example. We don't even have her name. She was, she was a great woman of Shunem. She was a Shunemite. I can't even think where that was on the map. But she was a great woman. Woman of faith. A faithful woman. A prayerful woman. A thankful woman. Thank God for her example. This morning I... I just want to give thanks to God for godly mothers. I thank God for my mother. I thank God that she still prays every day for me. She's more faithful at praying for me than I am. I thank God for my wife and mothers of mother of our daughters. She sees things and perceives things every day that I completely miss. I thank God for the mothers here in the church who are faithful, who are dedicated and supply everything that us guys lack. 
gives a congregation class. It does. I thank you for your example and your sacrifice. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that many years ago, the President saw fit to set aside to honor mothers. We need it. Lord, Lord, many times we would, we would completely overlook the need to give thanks. But I want to just stop this morning and give thanks for godly mothers. Lord, maybe there's some here this morning that have mothers that don't know thee as Savior. Would today, Lord, that change? Would today be the day that, that, that they accept thee as Savior? Lord, thank you for what you've done for us. Thank you for the example you've given for us to live. Thank you for the sacrifice that provides for us salvation, the blood of the cross. Lord, I pray that you be with us now as we dismiss. In Jesus' name, amen.